into this passage. Um, the, the passage that we're going into is, is perhaps a difficult one and one that I've, I've been wrestling with. Um, and we'll, we'll read it and we'll go through it now. You know, and, and, and you'll know this, but just to confirm this again, the Lord doesn't call us to do easy stuff necessarily. He calls us to do that which He's asked us to do. And sometimes that call is, is subjective. You know, it, it's not, it's not as, as clear, but you know when you need to do something and when something needs to be done um, and you have a sense that it doesn't matter if it's hard or not, this, this needs to be done. And that's kind of what this passage is. And, and, and you'll, you'll see that come through pretty clearly, I suppose, as, as we get into the text. So let's pray. And then we'll get, into, we'll get into the text this morning. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that there's not one jot or tittle that'll pass away, but your word will always remain. Heaven and earth will pass away, but your word remains. And so, Father, we know that it's good. We know that, um, that men of old wrote as they were inspired inspired by your spirit, the same spirit that would raise Christ from the dead, the same spirit that would indwell us. Lord, we pray that, um, that the spirit that you've, that you've deposited within us, Lord, the spirit that you've used to create within us a new heart, a soft heart, Lord, I pray that that spirit, Lord, would be alive and awake this morning in each and every one of us. Lord, as we come to your word, I pray that you'd speak it into our hearts. Lord, I pray the cleverness of man and, uh, and, and any, anything other than your voice, Lord, would be just completely drummed out. Lord, we want to hear from you this morning. Lord, we ask that you would do a work and that you would do it for your glory. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so as we come to the text this morning, we need to remember the context that we're in. And so you'll remember in the book of uh, uh, the chapter, John chapter 9, uh, we saw this blind man who's been healed. Now, importantly, it was on the back of the end of chapter 8 where Jesus would say, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. Jesus would claim deity. And once he claimed deity, the, the Pharisees would pick up stones to stone him. They understood exactly what he's saying. He was saying, I am God. They'd pick up stones to stone him and they couldn't. His time had not yet come. And so he walked through the midst of them. And as he was going out, he sees this man who is blind from birth. And he's going to touch and he's going to heal this man who was blind from birth, which is, of course, a fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 35, where the blind will see when the Messiah comes. The blind will see, the deaf will hear, the lame will walk. And Jesus did all of these miracles. And so first he claims deity, then he proves deity. And so we've got this beautiful picture of a blind man, physically blind man seeing. But as we see the progression of that blind man's life, first he calls Jesus, sir, then he'll call him Lord, and then he'll worship him. Right? And so he, he, he's, he's revealing himself more and more to this blind man who was physically blind and now could see, but who was spiritually blind. And ultimately now worshiping Jesus is spiritually um, awakened and is spiritually seeing. And so it's in that context that we get these three verses. These three verses from verse 39 in John chapter 9 say... And Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may be made blind. Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say we see, therefore your sin remains. Now, if you're anything like me, and you were reading through your Bible, as you do every day, of course, and you came across these three verses, you would probably look at these three verses and say, yep, I don't understand that, moving on. And that, that unfortunately seems to be a bit of a human condition. I have that same feeling almost in my own heart. When I, when I read these things, I can kind of glean from the surface that, that Jesus has said, well, I've, I've come, I'm going to be a stumbling block. Um, and and uh, those who think they can see, they're not the ones who are getting in. Um, the Pharisees are saying, well, 
are we blind also? Are you calling us names again? Because there was this fight thing going on. And I look at it and say, okay, I've understood enough and, and, and probably move on. But we would be amiss to do that because there's an incredible richness and there's an incredible depth in these three verses. And this, believe it or not, is where we're going to spend this morning in these three verses. And so let's have a look at them. In verse 39, Jesus says, For judgment I have come into this world. For judgment I have come into this world. Now when you read that, you would probably be right to say, but that doesn't sound right. For judgment I have come into this world. Just two weeks ago, we were in, in John chapter 8. And in John chapter 8 and verse 15, as I find the verse, John chapter 8 and verse 15 it says, you judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Jesus will say that I judge no one. In, in John chapter 12 and verse 47, and again, we know these things and that's why it kind of resonates with us. John chapter 7, um, sorry, John chapter 12 and verse 47. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. And so is Jesus contradicting himself? And that's the first thing we see, because so often we know Jesus said, I didn't come to judge the world. And here he's saying, for judgment, I have come into this world. And so what's going on? What's going on with this passage? It's really important, and it's not something that perhaps you're going to do in your morning devos, although I would encourage you to do it, and there's some beautiful tools out there. I like to use Blue Letter Bible. It makes things really, really easy. If you were to click on that word judgment, you would find that it's the only time in the book of John that that word judgment is used, or that version of the word for judgment is used, and we're going to unpack that just a little bit this morning. In fact, I'm going to teach you a little bit of the Greek, and it's going to be really easy for you to understand. And I've, I've, I've really trying hard not to make, not to make it into, into a bit of a joke, but you can understand why it's, why it's slightly funny in a second. The word judgment is krima, K-R-I-M-A, krima. The word for is eis, E-I-S. And so in order to remember this, it's eis krima, for judgment, eis krima. Sounds a lot like ice cream, and it really, this is how we work. We're going to remember that word because it's crema. It's the only place in the Gospel of John that it's used. That word is a noun, and that word describes the result of judgment. It's not describing the act of judging. It's describing the result of of judgment. So let's go and have a look at John chapter 5 because we've got another another two words. Krima is used here and it's used in Matthew chapter 7 verse 2 as well where it says with the judgment that you judge you will be judged as well. So Matthew chapter 7 uses that same word krima um, and it's about the result of the judgment. It's the it's the end result, it's not the act. But in John chapter 5 from verse 22, for the Father judges krino, krino, K-R-I-N-O, with a little stripe on the O, krino, that is the act, it's a verb, it's the act of judging. The Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment, judgment is krisis, K-R-I-S-I-S, and those are the three words that we've got, so that is also a noun, and it is also the result, but it is more of a, um, um, it, 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 it's, a, it's a different version of the result anyway. So it's a different version to the, to the word um, krima. And we're going to see that used the whole way through here. So the father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the son. So the verb, he judges no one. The result, judgment has been committed to the son. That all should honor the son as they honor the father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my words and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment. Crisis shall not come into the resultant judgment, but has passed 
from death into life. And that's us in Christ. We pass from death into life. We do not come into judgment. And we'll have a look at judgment in a minute. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. As the Father has life in himself, so he has granted to the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment. Again, Christus. Also, because he is the Son of Man. All the way down in uh, verse 29, he came forth, but those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Condemnation, crisis, it's the same word as judgment. It's exactly the same word, just translated in our Bible slightly differently. I can of myself do nothing, Jesus says. And that's an important doctrine for us. I can of myself do nothing. When we see the grace of Jesus, when we see the kindness of Jesus, when we see the love of Jesus, we're seeing the love of the Father, the grace of the Father, the mercy of the Father, because Jesus can of himself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, krino, the verb, and my judgment, krisis, is righteous, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. You see, there's a process of judging, which Jesus is going to do. But we see from that passage that we're going to skip that judgment. We're going to skip that judgment because we are found in Christ. We pass from death into life. The judgment with, with which he's judging is, is coming but that's not what he did when he came. So back in our text in, in verse 39, and Jesus said, for judgment, I have come into this world. Judgment is, a, is, is almost a doctrine that the church these days shies away from. When we say that we're saved, does that mean we're saved from dying and we get to go and sit on a cloud and play a harp and we get these cute little wings and what 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 does what does saved actually mean there is a doctrine in the bible and it's a doctrine which is taught by jesus and it's the truth of hell and this is certainly not intended to scare anyone although it is as scary as you can possibly as you can possibly imagine but hell is absolutely 100% real. And hell is going to be a place that, that perhaps would surprise you. And so perhaps even, even to start offensively on, on what we're talking about, hell is a place where we will find some of the kindest, some of the gentlest, some of the most loving, some of the most giving, some of the most happy, some of the most talented, some of the most uh, interesting, beautiful, smart, wise, some of the most religious, some of the most spiritual people. Why? Because hell is going to be a place where imperfection and sin is going to dwell. Heaven, heaven requires perfection. Heaven requires perfection. If there is any sin in heaven, it will quickly become earth. And you just need to watch the news. You just need to watch the news to see what a little bit of sin does. A little bit of sin leavens the whole lump. A little bit of leaven leavens the whole hump, lump. Heaven has to be perfect. Otherwise, it can't be heaven. It can't be heaven. Heaven, you're in the presence of the Creator God, who is perfect, and in Him can be no darkness. Heaven has to be perfect. And therefore, hell, which is as real as you and I, whether we choose to believe it or not, it's a little bit like gravity. You can choose not to believe in gravity, but if you jump off the roof, the result's going to be the same. You don't have to believe it for it to be true. The Bible will teach it though. And if you're going to believe Jesus for what Jesus tells you as far as salvation, if you're going to trust in him for salvation, the things which Jesus has said, well, Jesus taught on the subject of hell more than any other teacher. And so if we have a little bit of a look at perhaps what we're talking about, and, and, and remember, remember what we're looking at, judgment. The result of judgment is heaven or hell. Those are the two choices. And, and the church 
and even myself in my flesh, I want to tell you, don't worry, it's all going to be okay. But if you're not in Christ, it's not going to be okay. It's not going to be okay if you're not in Christ. This is serious, serious business. There is a heaven and we understand that and we love that and we want to constantly look towards that. But on the other side, there is a hell and it's going to be filled with incredible people who've missed the love of Jesus, who've missed the opportunity for perfection because it's the only standard. Christ came and became the gauge. He became the benchmark. He became, he became the, um, the, the cornerstone. It's where we measure from. It's a black and a white. It's a yes and a no. It's a right and a wrong. It is an absolute. You're in Christ and you're saved or you've rejected Christ and you've chose to stand in your own righteousness, which will never match up to that of a holy and a perfect God. And as such, judgment. What does the Bible say about hell? It describes it as darkness, absolute darkness. And perhaps here we even get a sense of your blindness. Have you ever been in a place which is so dark that you cannot see your hand in front of your face? Many of us have been to the Kango Caves and they do that thing where they turn the lights out. Your eyes almost hurt from the darkness because they're straining to see but can see nothing. Hell is darkness. Where did I get that from? It's Matthew 25 verse 30. There are flames in hell. There are flames in hell. You know what flames do? Flames hurt. And I'm not trying to dramatize this. This is what the Bible's teaching in, in Luke 16, verse 24. And we know that discourse in Luke 16, the largest discourse that Jesus will teach on hell. And no, it's not a parable. People are named. It's a truism. Luke 16, verse 24. There's burning. Isaiah 33, verse 14. There's burning in hell. There's weeping. Matthew 8, verse 12. There is weeping. You're going to use your eyes. They're not going to be for seeing because there's going to be utter darkness. They're going to be for weeping. There's going to be wailing. Matthew 13, verse 42. Gnashing of teeth. Have you ever been in that state of discomfort where you're grinding your teeth? Can you imagine that for eternity? Matthew 13, verse 50. Torments. Luke 16, verse 23. Everlasting punishment. Everlasting punishment. Hell, uh, hell is, is not a subject for polite company. It's not a subject for, for the dinner table. It's not something that we even want to consider. But if we don't from time to time, if we don't understand and apply the reality, uh, we become complacent. What have you been saved from, friends? What have we been saved from? We've been saved from that which we deserve. Our punishment for our rejection of a living God, and we'll have a look at that in Romans chapter 1, but we've all had an opportunity to see. If we are to reject, we're to choose, we're to choose hell over heaven. It shouldn't be a wonder that there's hell. It should be a wonder that Christ has given us an opportunity to escape what we genuinely deserve. Being apart from God, being completely separated from Him, because our sin will do that. You know, the world has this view, and this is Freddie Mercury. I used to love Queen, was my favorite band. Freddie Mercury would say, oh, I was not made for heaven. No, I don't want to go to heaven. Hell is much better. Think of all the interesting people you're going to meet down there. You see, the world would celebrate these things. The world would trivialize these things. The world would create a little picture of, a, of the red devil with the pitchfork and the pointy tail that sits on your shoulders and whispers nasty things in your ears. And we all think it's quite comical. The devil wants us to think that because that's a, an unoffensive little picture. He's foul and he's going to hell and it was prepared for him and the angels which rejected God. It was not prepared for you and I. And yet... And yet, if we are to step over the body of Jesus, if we're to miss the sacrifice, while we were yet sinners, he died for us, he bought us, he's redeemed us. If we're going to reject him, then there's going to be a judgment. And the judgment is real. The judgment should spur you and I who are saved on to reaching out to those who, who are not saved. And you know what? It may cause offense. If Camilla 
ran into the road. In fact, Katie just did this the other day and I wasn't there. But if she, if she were to run into the road right, and I would to grab anything I could grab, she would be offended by the fact that I grabbed her by the hair and I'd pulled her back as violently as I possibly could because there's a bus coming and it is going to kill her. Well, friends, there's a bus coming. There is a judgment coming. There is a judgment coming and I'm not trying to preach hellfire and damnation. Please don't get me wrong. This is the reality of what scripture teaches. There is righteous judgment coming. We have to be found in Christ. And thank the Lord that in Christ there is a way. We're not hopeless. We've not lost it all. It's simple faith in Jesus. And when we put our faith in Jesus, when we put our faith in Jesus, we are secured of heaven. Not do we just get away from hell, but we have an inheritance, 1 Peter 1, we have an inheritance which is kept, reserved for us, undefiled, undefiled, perfect, without sin, as we will be in Christ as we enter into heaven, as an inheritance, as sons and daughters of the Creator God of the universe in whose presence we will spend eternity in Christ, and in Christ, anyone who comes, anyone who comes that's in Christ will not die, but will pass from life to life. We will not, we will not have the second death. And the resultant judgment, which is this word that we've got here, the resultant judgment, which we will find, which we will find, is what the Lord requires, because He is holy. Jesus teaches, and I'll give you some references if you want to have a look at these, and it's perhaps important. Jesus would say, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but through me. We want to hold on to that. Jesus would affirm that it's him who will give us entrance into heaven. It's the same Jesus who will give us in Matthew 5, verse 22 and 29, a discourse on hell. In Matthew 10, 28, and Luke um, 12, 15. That's Matthew 10, 28 and Luke 12, 15. He will speak to us about he who can, um, that we're not to fear him who kills the body, but him who can deliver our, our souls into eternal torment. Matthew 11, verse 23. Matthew 16, verse 18. Matthew 18, verses 8 through 9. And Luke 23, sorry, Matthew 23, 15 through 33. All of these passages speaking of uh, of hell jesus speaking of hell friends this is real this is real judgment jesus said for judgment i have come into this world because of the resulting judgment to come i have come into this world he's actually giving us an opportunity for grace what he's saying is for grace i have come into this world because judgment is coming Jesus is God's grace in every way. And if we turn to, um, to Titus, Titus chapter 3. And again, Mark has been doing an incredible job in these pastoral epistles. Titus chapter 3, and we pick it up from verse 4. It says, But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior towards man appeared, that's talking about what's happening in our passage in John chapter 9. This is the time. Jesus is, is that time in John chapter 9 that, Titus, uh, that Paul in the letter to Titus is talking about. The kindness and love of God our Savior towards man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Christ Jesus, our Savior, that having been justified, just if I had never done it, purified of sins, having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life, having been justified by his grace, the grace of Jesus, which was there since before the world began. And we'll see that in 2 Timothy. If we go to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, I'll actually take it from verse 8. 
It says, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works. And that's important in the context of where we are. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus when before time began. Jesus is grace. He's always been grace. He's the embodiment of grace and grace would come through Christ Jesus because there is a judgment. Because God is holy and perfect and sin cannot be in his presence. Jesus needed to come. He needed to come and he needed to not give us mercy. Nobody asks for mercy when they come to God. They ask for grace. Don't give me what I deserve. And yet God gives you more than that. He gives you grace. He gives you what you don't deserve. An inheritance alongside the risen Christ in heaven. Not because of what you've done. Not because you've been good. But simply because you've turned over your heart and your life to Jesus. It's that simple. There is no other way and no other religion offers you a way to come into the presence of a perfect creator God, to live in his presence via a route that he has made for you. Therefore, it's perfect because God has made it. You see, God would pour out his perfect wrath. And Romans chapter 3 will help us with this. But God will pour out his perfect wrath on Christ. Therefore, the wrath of God is fulfilled upon Christ, the wrath that we deserved. And he can now be the judge and the justifier in one through Christ Jesus. The grace, the grace with which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death. And brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Good news of sins forgiven through faith in Christ alone. To which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. Paul would continue on in Timothy. You see back in our text in verse 39. Jesus said, for judgment, because there is judgment, I have come into this world. To offer grace. I have come into this world to offer grace that those who do not see may see, and those who see may be made blind. What's he saying? He's saying those who are trusting in their own works, those who are trusting in their own sufficiency, those who think they've got this thing made, those who are doing five prayers a day and they're looking this direction or they're hanging the dream catcher and charging their crystals, those who have this whole thing worked out, those will be made blind. Perhaps that's in a literal sense in the blackest darkness of a very real hell. But it's not necessarily the evil people that you think that we're going to find in that horrible, horrible place called hell. Revelation 14, um, Revelation 14 has has a terrible depiction of that same place, we're going to find kind people, gentle people, loving, giving, benevolent, brilliant, intelligent, beautiful, famous, popular, religious, spiritual. We're going to find good people. Good people don't get into heaven. Perfect people, only perfect people get into heaven. And it sounds arrogant to say that because I'm going to heaven. I'm not perfect. And yet clothed in the righteousness, which is the only way, clothed in the righteousness of Christ, I have entrance and you have entrance. And all who would bow their knee to Jesus have entrance. Doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, what you've done. Clothed in Christ's righteousness, you have entrance into perfection. Or you take your chances and stand before the great white throne and say, here's my filthy rags as my righteousness. I want entrance. And I'm afraid if you're not perfect, you can't enter into heaven. Heaven has to be perfect. Verse 40. Some of the Pharisees 
who were with him heard these words and they said to him, are we blind also? They said to him, well, are we ignorant? Because what you're telling us is that the ignorant get to get to see anyway. So are we, are we okay here? You know, you just, you're just going to come and you're just going to sort everything out. That's not what Jesus is teaching at all. And he's going to answer them and he's going to say, Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. If you were completely ignorant, if you were completely without any inkling, you would have no sin. But now you say we see, therefore your sin remains. These were the same people. You remember what they told the man who was blind, who was schooling them in the things of Christ? How can a man who's demon possessed do such miracles, he would say to them. If he weren't good, if he weren't from God, how could he open my eyes? And they would turn around and say to him, you were completely born in your sins. And are you teaching us? We were born with a silver spoon. We were the ones that understood the scriptures. We were the ones who, who are, are lawyers of the law. We know what's going on here. We've got clear sight. And Jesus is saying to him, no, you don't. You're saying that, you're saying that Moses, Moses is the one that you're looking up to. Well, Moses wrote of me, Jesus will say. You're blind. You cannot see, but you're trusting in your own works. You're trusting in your own prideful works to get your entrance into heaven. That's not the formula. You cannot be perfect. We all have sin. But in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus, there is perfection. There is perfection for all of us. And so Jesus says to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. And so we immediately start thinking, I know how your minds work because mine does too. We immediately start thinking, well, does that mean if you're, if you're ignorant of this thing, then you get away with it completely? Well, Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 is really helpful for us. And Romans chapter 1 makes it very clear from verse, um, <clears throat> from verse 18 for time. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth. And this is what happens. You'll suppress the truth. There's a war against hell in the church. People don't want to hear about it because it's offensive. It's dirty. It's disgusting. It's one of those things which you think, how, how, can, how can a loving God do this? We even look at the eternal nature of hell. Jesus would say well, the, the flame never dies. It never goes out. There's an eternal nature of hell. And we look to say, well, I, that's a bit harsh, isn't it? That, that's, that's horrible. Hell can't be an eternity of suffering and pain, can it? Well, the Bible teaches that. But how, how do we reconcile that good people, loving people, giving people? They just, they just missed Jesus. No, they stepped over the body of Jesus. They stepped over him on the way to hell. But how can it be eternal? That just doesn't make any sense. You know what? It doesn't make it doesn't make just sense necessarily in my own mind sometimes when I when I sit and I ponder these things. But I do know this that when I get to the other side, I'm gonna see clearly. And God's judgments are true, and God's judgments are right, and God's judgments are absolutely 100% correct. And we're going to say yes and amen to every single one of them. And we don't have all the details. There are those who say that hell will, will, will have somebody as um, annihilated after a time. They say that the flames will go on for eternity, but the torment won't. We try and explain away this difficult subject. We're saved from something. And it is a frightening, disgusting, yet perfectly just punishment for sin, which is a rejection of the Lord in every way. And so none of us are with excuse, again, Romans from, from verse 19 now, because what may be known of God, this is verse uh, chapter 1, verse 19, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, clearly seen there's no excuse here being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and guarded so that they are without excuse jesus would say if you were blind you would have no sin and here we see in romans that we can all see and that we're without excuse the heavens declare the glory of god because although they knew god they did not glorify him as god 
nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, and that's a problem that we all have, professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. We worship images and things and these idols which we set up. The birds and the four-footed animals and the creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. And, and here we have an affront to the whole LGBTQI, Elemino people thing that, that, that's going on. And, and the Lord addresses it absolutely clearly. And he says, who exchange the truth of God, the truth of God for the lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their woman exchanged the natural use for that which is against nature. Likewise, also the men having the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and received in themselves the penalty of the error which was due. It continues on and then in, in uh, chapter 2 it says, Therefore, because of all of these things, because we know these things, you are inexcusable, O oh man, because we know these things. Romans chapter 2, verse 1, You are inexcusable, O oh man. Romans chapter 3, if we jump across there very quickly, down to verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Here's our legal contract, whom God set forth as a propitiation, as a replacement, to take our place, God set forth as a perpetuation by the blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he may be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You see, Jesus would say, I came for judgment. He didn't say, I came to judge. That's going to happen. The result of that judgment is going to be something which you and I actually don't want to comprehend. And yet, we would do well to understand what we've been saved from. We would do well not to shy away from the Bible, what so clearly speaks of this terrible place called hell. Keep our visions on Jesus and we know that through him and his grace and his love for us, we find ourselves, we find ourselves heirs, joint heirs with Christ to the eternal things which have been prepared for us, which have been kept for us. We're coming to the communion table. We're coming to celebrate what Christ has done for us. The passage which I really enjoy using is in Corinthians, and it's 1 Corinthians 11. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul is dealing with issues in the Corinthian church. One of the issues that he's dealing with is that when they took communion, some of them were getting drunk. Yes, they used real wine because otherwise you couldn't get drunk. Some of them were getting drunk at the communion table. They would come to celebrate the Lord's Supper and they would eat like they hadn't eaten in days. They would be gluttons and those who didn't have to eat were left out on the, uh, on the outskirts. Paul's addressing that and he's saying, when we come to this table, let's remember these things. Let's remember what Christ has done for us and let's be prepared to grab Camilla by the hair and rip her out of harm's way. Let's be prepared to grab our brother, our sister, our neighbors, our boss, our staff, our husband, our wife, our children. Now, God has no grandchildren. Everyone needs to come to him firsthand. God has children. He's got many children. But everyone needs to come to him. 
And so Paul, in verse 23 of chapter 11 of Corinthians, having dealt with these problems in the church, would say, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is how we remember Christ. His body broken for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God would pour out his wrath on Jesus Christ so that he didn't have to pour it out on you. He says, do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my body. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Jesus is coming back. He's coming back on a white horse with a sword in his hand for judgment. He is coming back to execute judgment. Krino. He's going to do the verb. He is going to judge. The resultant is going to be heaven or hell. And if we're not found in Christ, the resultant is going to be hell every single time. Because if you're not perfect, which can only be found in Christ, then you've chosen, you've chosen the consequence. Paul says, therefore, in verse 27, Whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. In context, they were getting drunk. They were gluttonizing. They weren't doing this in a worthy manner. But you know what? That doesn't exclude us from examining ourselves. We come to communion table and we try and do it once a month on the first Sunday of a month. And so often we, we will sit in the Lord's grace and we'll say, I'm saved, but we'll forget what we're saved from. And I think this morning, perhaps it's a good time for reflection. As the Lord would say, it's for judgment, because there is a judgment. I've loved you this much that I've taken that on myself. If you will put your faith in me. And it's that new covenant that we celebrate this morning with communion. So if you have your bread and the juice... Let's pray for the bread and, uh, and, and we'll give thanks together. The Lord's body broken for us. Our Lord, we thank you that you loved us this much. Lord, that you would sacrifice of yourself to reconcile us back to you. Lord, we pray that we wouldn't take this lightly. Lord, we pray that the gospel, the good news, the simple truth of sins forgiven with our faith in Jesus, Lord, would always be on our lips. Lord, we pray that as we partake of your body and remember you, Lord, Father, that you would do a work in us, that you would fill us afresh and anew, Lord, that you would give us a new awe for you, a new zeal for your word, Lord, a new purpose in the gospel of Jesus to the lost which are around us. Good people, not perfect people. Lord, we know that we still mess up and we ask for forgiveness. Lord, we know that if we confess our sins to you, Lord, that you're faithful and you're just to forgive us our sins. We ask, Lord, that you'd forgive us, that you would make in us a new heart. Lord, help us to stay absolutely 100% committed to you. And Lord, if and when we fail, Lord, to come back to confess our sins and have you who is our justifier, our propitiation, Lord, take our place for these things. We know that we're forgiven. We're forgiven by the blood of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your body broken for us. We partake gladly together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I can't imagine an uncertain eternity. I can't imagine putting my hope in some, in some deity, 
in some thing, in some work, which I have no certainty that is going to gain my entrance. I can't imagine the risk, the risk of hell. I, I don't do sick well. I don't know about you. But that feeling of sick, that feeling of pain, that feeling of darkness, that feeling of falling, loneliness, I can't risk that. There is one place. There is one place and there's one covenant. The covenant has been given to us. It's been prophesied. It's been fulfilled in Christ Jesus. And it's impossible that anyone else <clears throat> could ever be the Messiah of the Bible. It's impossible when you look at the word of God for it to be inerrant. It is perfect in all of its ways. And it gives us absolute assurance <clears throat> of a new covenant. That's that legal covenant that we just looked at in Romans chapter 3. That Christ and God in Christ can be both the judge and the justifier through the blood of Jesus. Perfectly man to take on our sins, but perfectly God to beat them in every way. And so as we come to this cup, Father, we thank you for this new covenant in your blood. Lord, we thank you for absolute assurance total assurance that as we accept the work that you've done, Lord, as we make you Lord of our lives, Father, you wash us clean, you make us new, and you give us an assurance of an inheritance which is undefiled and kept for us. Lord, we thank you for what you've done. We thank you for this new covenant in your blood, Lord. We pray that you would, Lord, fill us afresh, Fill us new. Do your work in us, Lord. Thank you for your sacrifice, Lord Jesus. We gladly accept it even now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Complacency has no place in a Christian's life. I would rather preach a thousand messages on the incredible nature of the Lord's grace. And I pray that this was a sense of that this morning. And yet without the other side, what have we been saved from? We need to apply this in our own lives. We need to think about that for the beautiful people, the kind, the loving, the gentle, the godly seeming, the religious, the brilliant, all of whom without Christ will not gain entrance into heaven, but not just not gain entrance into heaven. They'll have a consequence in the hell that the Bible teaches. It needs to, needs to affect us. It needs to affect us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Father, that you've opened our eyes. We thank you, Lord, that in you we have fullness of joy. And at your right hand, Lord, are pleasures forevermore. Lord, we thank you that we get to consider these good things because we're in Christ. Lord, I pray that you'd steal us. Lord, that you would, uh, that you would give us a zeal for the lost around us. Lord, that those who don't know you would hear about you, Lord that they'd see you through our actions, Lord. I pray that you give us great wisdom, Lord, not to run out gung-ho and, and make a big mess of things. But Father, in your wisdom and in the, the meetings and the abilities which you have prepared for us in the strength that you give us, Lord, we would walk boldly in the things that you've called us to, that we would affect eternity around us, Lord. Pray for our friends and our family. Lord, I pray for those who don't know you, Lord, those who are affected with many tribulations and trials even now, even thinking of this pandemic which is raging. Lord, I pray that you would use these difficulties and hardships as, as a goad, Lord, to poke people, to push people towards the truth of the free gift of God through Christ Jesus. Your grace being manifest to us through Christ Jesus, Lord. We pray that you'd protect us, Lord, that you would keep us, that you would go before us and behind us even this week. Lord, make our paths straight and bring us back together safely again, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.